We are coming off of a great week, Greg, here so far. I hope you guys are having a great week. I will say that every once in a while on the Cosmos, one week is just like 10 times the other week before. I don't know why. It's like this Bermuda Triangle of all the stuff converged on this week, and it's just kind of hell to get through. But when you get through that and all the uh, you know successes you've had, all your wins, you chalk them all up, it's a good week. It's just a good week. And this week, it just has to be one of those weeks. Just everything's piling up on it. Everything is coming together, but we're winning. We're just winning left and right. I hope you guys are winning too. I want to talk about dopamines. That's what we all crave, right? A little dopamine drip, a little bliss on tap. We're always happy. We always want to be happy. We want to be in the zone. We want to be excited. We're just ready to go out. You know, it's like Friday night. We're ready to go and party and have fun and be with our friends. That is a good feeling. That is a great feeling. And it's a feeling that we long for all the time. And I want to talk about how to get there more often than not. Think back to the last time you're at a restaurant. Maybe even yourself. I hope it's not you. uh, Let's say we're going to talk about you for a little bit. You're at a restaurant and you're on your phone and you're flipping through social media. Do you know you're looking for that little dopamine hit when you do that? Every time you scroll, you're looking for that dopamine hit. Now let's think about your environment. You're at a restaurant, you're with other people, or you're by yourself and you're at the bar. There's a lot of people around you. You're in public. It's fun. You're outside. You're away from your home. And yet you have locked yourself in a little tiny prison. You're on your phone. You're pretty much telling the world, go away. I'm in my own zone. And you're looking for little dopamine hits as you scroll. Do you know the worst thing that we can do as a society is put you in prison? And then the worst thing we can do in prison is put you in solitary confinement? to be absolutely by yourself, to go mad, by yourself. You're only in your own thoughts. Nobody around you. And yet in our society today, what happens? You put yourself in that own little prison all by yourself where you search for that little dopamine hit. You're not alone. 80, 90% of the world does it. Look around a restaurant. How many people are on the phones? A couple. Date night. They're going out. Both of them on? They're both on their phones staring at each other. Are not staring at each other. We wish they're staring at each other. They're just staring at their phones. Why does our brain prefer that over being out in public and socializing and meeting new people? Dopamines. Our brain gives little bits of happiness. You need to eat that chocolate chip cookie. It tastes great. A little dopamine drop. You're super happy. You get done with the chocolate chip cookie. Not as happy. Why? Because at that moment, you release the little chemical inside your brain that says, this is awesome. This is great. And you ate the chocolate chip cookie. It was awesome. Same thing with your social media. Every time you flip and something cutesy, a little cat video, a little cool architectural video, some inspirational quote happens, a little dopamine drop happens in your brain. Everybody's crazed this. I will tell you what, 20 years ago when social media didn't exist, you know, people even have smartphones. You had the star tech, you had the flip phone and all you could do is call people and still that you're on the, you know, the edge of technology. I will tell you how we did a dopamine hits. I'll tell you how I did it. I worked out all the time. I've worked out since I've been 16 years old. I work out five days a week. I've never skipped a day. I let, well, that's bull. We all know I've skipped a day. I try not to skip a day, but we're always, I'm always in the gym. I am always there. And you know what muscles I worked out? My biceps, my triceps, my chest, my shoulders, my abs, all the beach muscles. Because when I was done, they felt great. And I got that dopamine release and I felt amazing. And you know what muscles I didn't work out for 20 years of my life? Legs. Because when I got done with legs, I felt like I couldn't walk. Nothing good comes from leg day. It hurts. It sucks. I walk around with a stick up my butt for two more days until the legs finally give out. They finally breathe again. They finally stretch out and I can actually walk normal again. I hate leg day. So what did I do? I skipped leg day for 20 years. If you were to see me five years ago, I was the most disproportionate individual you've ever seen. It was embarrassing because I was looking for that dopamine fix all the time. Now, for the last five years, what have I done more than any other muscle? Legs. Do I walk around with a stick at my butt? Yes. Do I hate it? Yes. But I have so much more joy now in my life because my body's proportionate. I'm insanely stronger. I didn't know that legs are one of the root muscles and one of your foundations for everything in life. 
uh, I can do so much more with my body and, and be a better performance in almost all of my sports. So that brings a lot of joy. You know, a couple of podcasts ago, uh, Dr. Aaron Warner was here. We talked about joy versus happiness and happiness is a fleeting moment and joy is long lasting. And those little dopamine hits are just little bits of happiness. There's no lasting impression there. That's not going to help you a lot. So I want to talk about an employee I have because I'm, this is, you know, this is going back to work. This is the best to make your company as good as possible. And you guys have to better yourself. But I really want you to better yourself for the business. I mean, that's what work goal is here. And I had an individual here. This was 2005, 2006. Now, back then, it took me a year and a half to figure out this employee, what made him tick, and then guide him into what he needed to do. Now, I met this individual uh, outside of work, and he had the personality of three people. He was super uh, energetic. He was happy. He was life of the party. Uh, he was a good-looking gentleman, so it was, it was as easy to just you know be friends with him. And as you watched this and watched his charisma, I said, oh, man, he'd do so good in the sign world. And I brought him on as a project manager and soon into sales. And when he was at his desk, he would get the schedule lined up and he would tell the installers what needed to happen. And he was smiling. And he was happy. And he brought a good energy to the company. And then when it was, uh, you know, setting up the fields out in the field, he'd call people, he'd be talking, he'd joke with them and go, how's the better half doing? What's going on with your kids? And he knew everybody about everything. He had good relationships with every single person he was working with. And then when it came to sales, he wasn't confident in the product. He didn't feel it was a good value for the product. And what would happen was he'd get on the phone and go, hi, how you doing? How's your day? This is awesome. This is great. So, so we have this little project here. And if we, you know, you could get that, that, that signed contract, that'd be great with you to move it on. It. Okay. So let me know. And he literally would drop his voice. He would start to mumble inside the phone. I could hear clients go, what, what did you just say? And for anybody that's in sales, I know you're cringing right now like I am. You know all the confidence just got uh, lost. You know the persons are questioning why they're working with him. They're like, what did I miss that this guy's even showing me that's not right? And all these insecurities about the sell or buying that sign from us all reared its ugly head. And it was all because this guy didn't like to do it. Then it got so bad that he would actually go out to the shop and find things to make himself productive so he didn't have to do sales. I'd find him in the assembly department, and he's like, well, all these interior signs have to go out tomorrow, so i got to help out. Oh, the installers need a separate person to dig, so they got to go out. And he would find himself little jobs to keep himself busy. And if he kept himself busy, he was being productive. A productive person's a good person, right? I'm checking my boxes. I earned my paycheck. I'm a happy camper because I was productive for this company. No, he wasn't. He wasn't productive at all. We already had people on the payroll to do the jobs he was doing. We didn't have anybody on the payroll to do the job that he was supposed to be doing. He was looking for his little dopamine fix. He was looking to be happy and stake inside of his little bubble and not go out and do a hard job that might take a long amount of time and then to find tr true joy, to find true you know, pride in what he was doing by making a sale and giving this person a great product. So how do we fix this individual? How do we get him off the dopamine kick? It's almost like a drug. I feel like, a, you know, we're, we're talking about drugs here. You got to, you know, get this guy off, uh, off the narcotics, but it really is the ultimate narcotic, the dopamine drop on your head. You can start to the beginning, as much as I hate to say it. It's a whole lot easier to train from the beginning than it is to rehab somebody. When you first get your puppy, you get a new dog, what's the first thing you do? Put a collar on him, start a little bit of training. Come, sit, stay, shake. Fred is a puppy, right? You don't want to try and train this when the dog's nine years old. You want to train them when they're a puppy because they're eager to learn. They're excited to learn. Same thought process when you have a new employee. When they first walk in the door, they're excited to be here. They're eager to learn. They want to make a difference. They want to have a sense of pride where somebody looks at them and goes, wow, you're doing a great job. That's, that's pride. That's right in here. That feels good. Your job in that first 90 days is to train them to search for the joy in all the projects that they do, for the projects that you hired them to do. In the first 90 days, you better see that employee at least three to four times a day. Ask them how they're doing, what's going on. 
I want you to guys to make sure that they see you and know that they're a valued member. If you bring them on and they're just gone and we never see them again, or you walk by and just give them a, a little pansy wave and keep walking by, that doesn't do anything. That doesn't steal confidence. They're not confident in the work that they're doing. They're still questioning whether they're doing it right or wrong. But if you walk up and say, hello, how you doing? What project are you working on? And you start asking questions, that's going to invoke them to interact with you. And two things happen. Number one, they're excited that they matter, that you took the time to listen to them. And number two, you're going to be able to see where they're mentally at and how to redirect or recreate based on what's going on. If you can redirect them through questions, that's even better. You know, I got a really good friend of mine and actually him and I are doing a tough mutter here in August together. That infinity mutter, he's part of my four man team. And he was a good friend through high school. We were all best friends through high school and college. And, and he's still a good friend of mine today. He was actually my superior boss when I first went over to a lumber company here when I was 18 years old. You know how he taught me? He just kept asking questions. What does the color green mean? How much can that forklift lift? Where do you clock out at the end of the day? Do you know what to say when a customer pulls in? He never once told me he only asked questions and I answered and then he would redirect my answer after I answered. He managed by asking questions and made you think. Not only did that make me learn at a much rapid rate, not only did I absorb so much more because of what was going on, but he did it with such a smooth manner. Well, what does the blue color mean? What's the green color? Should these flowers be outside or inside? You know, and I had to sit there, stare at it, think, learn on my own, bring it to the table myself. And that was what made everything easier for me to grasp because I had to think for myself and then I was redirected. Now, unfortunately, a psychological thing is you will always remember what you were wrong. You will never remember all the things when you were right, but 100% you remember when you were wrong because an emotion is attached to an event and they burn together and you memorize them forever. When you're wrong and someone corrects you, you have an emotional reaction that happens. You as an adult should have curtailed this emotional to something very tiny and minute. You should at this point in time say, Oh, yep, I was wrong. Thank you and move on and not have that be such a soul-sucking event that it does when you're a teenager. You know, when you're in a high school and somebody says you're wrong, you're like, oh God, they're not going to like me. You know, you see, you have this gigantic emotional um, interaction that happens in your brain when somebody tells you wrong when you're younger. As an adult, I'm praying that you have killed that and it's just a little change. But nonetheless, when you are wrong, that emotion and that event burns together and you're going to memorize it forever. So as you ask questions and people give you answers, you're going to be able to guide them and instruct them a lot faster. Number three, let them screw up. Let them screw up to a point that, you know, it doesn't cost you thousands of dollars, but if they're doing something wrong, let them go down that path for a little bit and then say, why did you do it this way? What's going to happen with that? They're not going to break or kill your company, but you're going to teach them never to go down that path again because they have to stop back up and then redo that work again. Sometimes going down the wrong path and learning the hard way is the best way to teach. I'm not saying every time, but I'm saying it does, it helps. It does help. Those first 90 days are paramount to making a good employee that is driven, that has pride, that has that sense of joy inside of them every single time they finish a project. Somebody that's looking for that dopamine fix, somebody that's on their social medias all the time, they're always on their phone, they're looking for quick fixes. Those little quick fixes, they don't do anything. They don't do anything for the long run. In fact, the opposite, I think they almost have an uh, adverse effect on our society. We're just a little bit more cranky because we're not getting that instant dopamine drop every time we scroll on social media. I know for me personally, over the last couple of years, I'm so fast to pick up my phone. As soon as I'm bored, phone. Nothing's going on, I can relax, phone. I have to physically set my phone down and say, no, I'm not going to do it. I'm not going to pick this up. I'm going to sit here and enjoy the moment. I might even just kind of zen out and do anything, but I'm not going to grab that phone. I'm not looking for that dopamine hit. I'm looking for long lasting joy and I'm not looking for that dopamine fix. For you guys, 
work with the new employees, try and rehab the old ones, get them that sense of pride and that sense of joy. I think that's what's going to be the best thing that's going to move and make uh, the needle move on making your company even more efficient than what it is before. Thank you, guys.